Well, that was being a work in his life. Plenty of love for you in the room, mate. Did you help, Michael? It does. Yes. There's a power one. That's all right, you'll have to bear with me. Have I got it? No. That one? That's yep. the one. Oh, hang on, this is going to work, isn't it? Yes. Okay. As I said, bear with me. I've had plenty of time to think about this being alone in my truck five days a week. But when it came to writing it all down, everything just disappeared. So, I call it rediscovery of faith. And I've called it that because I believe before we're born, we all know and have faith in God. It's only once we're born we forget the love is instilled in us. Some of us are raised within families that follow the faith every day, so we don't forget it. I was not one of these people. I'm sorry if I go over this, John, but being the timekeeper, but trying to condense 40 years down into a few minutes, it's I'm going to be a bit hard. Here, but you go for it. Thanks, John. Now, I was born into a family of three, 1979, on Easter Sunday. 1979. So, yes, Carolyn, that makes me old. <laughs> What a cutie. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> I didn't say that, she did. Didn't have to, it's all good. <laughs> now my parents separated when I was about four, and I remember thinking that it was because of me as a typical kid. It wasn't until later in life that my mum told me exactly the type of person that my father was, that I never saw, and I swore that I would never become him. Unfortunately, one day I did. Now, my brother and I got along for the early years, and I can't remember when it changed, but it did. It got to the point where if I walked past his bedroom door, he'd come running out, slam me onto the ground, grind my head into the floorboards with his foot. Now, to get, past, get out of my room, I had to go past his door. Every time. Every time it happened. So home life with him wasn't the best. Now is this God's doing? Now when I say this throughout, I had no idea. No idea. Because I never really had a religious influence in my life on my mum's side. But I had a very religious grandmother on my dad's side. And I remember when my stepsister and I were around nine, ten years old, middle of summer, as kids do, on a farm, you might ran in a dam, you get wet. She was made to go and sit inside a tin shed until her shirt dried because you could see where the nipples were. And it wasn't right for a little girl to feel like that or look like that. Let's get rid of that one. Uh -huh. I grew up in Nambour. There was used to be preachers standing on the corner of the ANZ bank. Bible in one hand, screaming to the streets. It's a little bit weird. Didn't know what to think of it, but I was only so young, so I didn't really take much more than I thought. Schooling started at St. Joseph's Catholic College. I remember saying a prayer every morning, going into the church and going to the school, finger into the holy water, cross, make your way. And because that was being in grade one, and 34 years ago. Yes, Carolyn, I can't remember back that far. That's about it. Now I was a big kid going through school. And being my main influence and lived with her was my mum. I was a mum's boy. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but being a fat kid and being a mum's boy at the same time. <laughs> yeah, not good. To say I was picked on quite a lot in primary school was an understatement. At the start of high school, I weighed about 120 kilos. 
with acne craters in my face that will arrive on the road. And if that didn't get me picked on enough, two months after I started high school, I needed glasses. The old social security trial glasses. Thick brown frames, half inch thick lenses. Coke bottles. I look like Mr. Magoo's nephew. <laughs> No, I don't have a photo of that one. Why not? No, just wait for the other photos. No, I didn't have many friends get picked on. So I thought, hey, what can I do to be picked on a little bit less? I know, I'll, I'll, I'll play music. So I picked the saxophone. That was a winner, right there. Not. It didn't help at all. In any way. Yeah, better than a tutor. But even though I was a big kid, I still tried to get out, be involved in all the sports, do whatever I could, gain friends. I even became part of the chess team and became a champion. <laughs> that didn't work either. And there was this God's doing. Still don't know. Halfway through grade eight, I decided that I was going to lose weight for my formal. Feel good about myself, look good. Five years, I got down to 95 kilos. I felt good. I asked a few partners, be my partner, be my dad for the night. Yeah, no. <laughs> Did happen. So I went by myself. I still had a good night, celebrated the end of my school. Now here's where it gets tough. After school, I got in with the wrong crowd after I moved out home. Drugs and alcohol were an everyday part of my life. Marijuana, speed, didn't matter, tried it. And the weight dropped off, dropped down to the low 80s. When I was 21, I was the youngest cab driver in Australia. The youngest cab driver in Australia. One dollar cup night, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Being in Melbourne Cup, running flat out, six hours. I, nature was knocking on the door. I had to answer the call. So I pulled up at a park where there was toilets. Did what I had to do. As I was walking back to the car, I was hit from behind. I had knees driven into my back and I, I had something cold pressed against the side of my neck. Where's the money? I pulled the keys out of my pocket, handed them over and said, it's in the car. My life wasn't worth $4,000. It was worth more. I didn't realise it at that point. I was told to stay on the ground for two minutes while they got away. And if I didn't, I'd get more than this. And they ran what was against my neck up. <coughs> Instant pain. And I didn't move for, it, it felt like hours, absolute hours. And when I did, I put my hand to my neck, I looked at it and I was covered in blood. Completely covered in blood. I got back to the car, pushed the emergency button, just repeated over and over, I've been marked to help me, urgent, I've been marked to help me. To their credit, the ambulance company, the taxi company had the police and ambulance there within about three minutes. I was completely soaked in blood by that stage, and the ambulance officer told me that the cart was so clean and so precise that it couldn't have been done with anything other than a surgical scalpel, and that I was lucky. For months I couldn't touch a knife, I couldn't see a knife. I had to have my food cut up for me. I had to sit in the lounge room away from everybody else because I couldn't see them handling knives without freaking out. Taxi had made me curl up in a ball and cry. Was this God's doing? Not long after that, I saw what the bottom of the barrel looked like. 
I didn't like what it looked like. So I thought the best thing to do was smash through it and keep going down. And I made a stupid decision and I tried to commit suicide. I woke up in the hospital with my mum and my uncle sitting there. And right there I did the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my entire life. I asked for help. It was so hard that I had to do it. I spent a week in the psychiatric unit of the hospital and they taught me techniques to recognise when I was going down and to build a platform. Once I hit that point, ask for help. I never got that low again. Was that God's will? Trying to get my life back on track. I met a girl. We developed a relationship. We moved in together. And then one day she belted me across the face with news that I was not expecting. I was going to be a father. <laughs> was I ready for it? Was I going to be a good father? I never got to answer the questions. Before Alicia Louise arrived, my little girl, I cleaned my life up for her. I cherished every single minute that I had with her. I could not be there for her. So I had to do whatever I could to be the father that she needed. Things were going well. And everything was going really well. Two years later, my world fell apart and crumbled around me. I lost the hardest, most amazing man that I've ever known. My grandfather. Two weeks to the day after that photo was taken, I lost him. He was everything. He was my rock. He was my support. He was the strongest, most stubbornest man that I've ever met. He'd be working down in his workshop doing woodwork, big band saw, pushing it through, straight down and stuff. Yeah. He'd walk like this up to the bathroom, rinse it out, wrap tape around it, pull a little sleeve on that he made for it, then he made for it and did it all at once. <laughs> and he'd go back down, finish doing what he was doing on the saw, then drive himself to the hospital. After he passed, my world crumbled, my relationship with my daughter's mother fell apart, and I became a father that was there for my child every second weekend. It's not how it should be there. But was that God's doing? <laughs> Carol may get a laugh out of the next one. Now music's always played a huge part of my life. Always. From making music while at school to listening to music every day of my life since. I cannot get through a single day without listening to music. Everything from the classics, Strauss, Tchaikovsky, Mozart, Love It All. I went and saw Pavarotti in concert. That was the most amazing concert I've ever seen. Right through to Led Zeppelin, Corn, Disturbed. I can listen to it and appreciate it all. Because somebody out there is making music for the enjoyment of themselves and others. And I can appreciate it and love it. I've just recently bought myself a blue straight soprano saxophone. I've got two others, no caramel. No. I'm, I'm learning again. I, I can't play like I used to, but I am, I am getting there. I'm practicing on it. So, with my love of music and being offered the chance to be paid to entertain, and I still can't believe I'm putting this photo up here, but 
I was, paid to, I was paid to entertain and have fun. Rocky. Jamie Fur. <laughs> it was Frank and Fur, but that's Jamie Fur. And no, I do not wear that any time other than on a special weekend. <laughs> yes, I can sing, I enjoy singing, but I'm not about to take Ron's place anytime soon. Sorry? <laughs> no, you're more than welcome to stay Ron. Let's get rid of that. Let's make the cat ass in the bag. Yeah. Now. <laughs> that's not, I, I do the sound. That's, that's where I am. Everything was going well through the karaoke life. And then two years again, I lost my head. That happened on a Friday night. I was just about to start, start a gig. And my partner at the time got the phone call. She didn't tell me until five hours later. I know there's nothing I could have done. She was already gone. I, I probably treated her quite badly on that, but at that time, I, that's how I felt. So I, I lost both my grandparents. And yeah, it, it killed me. But we carried on. I did handle her passing better than what I handled my grandfather's, but I haven't really mourned for either one of them properly yet. I know I haven't. But life carried on. It had to. And then I was rocked again. This little one came along. Alexis Jane. She's cheating you on both ends. <laughs> After we got married, she was six weeks old when we, her mum and I got married. We lasted about two years. I wasn't fully to blame for the breakup though this time, but. Was that God's doing? Was his hand in there? Everything was going well with her, meaningful relationship, until some dangerous allegations were raised by her mother against my father, and she was taken away from me. Sixteen months. I didn't even know whether that little girl was alive. Killed me every day. So with the marriage broke down and that happening, I turned to alcohol. I was drinking so much that in less than six months I lost over half my body weight. I went from about 133 kilos down to my lowest at 62. I thought I looked good. I was buying nice, nice shirts and smaller pants than what I'd ever bought. But at the same time there was just Something didn't feel right, and it was about the same time I was meeting Diane. Checked in with the doctor, and organs in my body decided that they weren't working properly. They were starting to shut down, and they were slowly killing me. That was my doing. I was taking so many pills at the time, my body was rattling like a, a jar filled with lollies, whatever. And I started having the thoughts that I hadn't had since after I'd been mugged. I was struggling again. But someone saved me. Was it God? saved me that day, that she sent me a message and said, how do you look like a pretty down to earth kind of guy? Was that God's doing? Mm -hmm. With everything that I was going through, when I met her, 
I put her through hell. <laughs> Absolute hell. I was not a nice person to live with. I was still, I was dealing with my daughter, with fighting for Lex, having the thoughts, being sick, sleeping 20 hours a day, and trying to work, trying to be a partner. I owe that woman everything. Mm. I owe her everything. She's the reason why I stand here today before you. I can never thank her enough for what she's done. Now I've always had, a, I've felt like I've always had a dark cloud hanging over my life. I have made this part of it disappeared with the story around. Right? We're moving on. We're getting there and we're raising the kids. Fighting for legs. Then one day we had to move. So we applied for a house and we're not back. Three weeks later we got a phone call from the real estate saying, the house is still available, would you like it? Sure we would. I said yes, so we moved. The day we moved in, we had a neighbour come over. <laughs> Who said you could move into my street? <laughs> that was John. <laughs> that was John. Since moving in, both John and Jane have experienced the highs and lows of our life. Now I've made some bad decisions, I've made some good decisions. I've made decisions that have got me in trouble with the law. John and Joan have said this. They've not judged us. They've not stayed away. They've offered their friendship, their guidance and their support. And I can't thank them enough. I cannot thank them enough. June 10 last year, it was the best day of my life apart from when my daughters were born. The person that came into my life at the right time and saved me said magical words. I do. <laughs> More of the black cow disappeared. We haven't had the best life but we've been right there for each other and supported each other every step of the way. Now I've lost people in my life, friendships. A lot of it has been because of me. Sometimes it's because of them. Just this week I said goodbye to a friendship that I've had for the better part of 25 years because it was just toxic. I didn't realise it until probably about six months ago. So I ended it. I walked away. Now with Alicia, I lost her on Father's Day of 2015. I wake up every day and want for her loss. She hasn't been called home. But due to the alienation from her mother and other family members, I have not seen her since Father's Day of 2015. It hurts, but I've got a family to still think about and family to support, so I have to get up every every morning and do what I do. Now, it was a little over 12 months ago before we got, just after we got married. Don and I were talking and we felt something was missing. Couldn't explain what it was, but we felt something was missing. Something was missing within ourselves. So we spoke about it, and then I went over to see John and Joan and asked them about church. They invited us to their church, this church. A little bit sceptical when I turned up, but we were greeted and warmly welcomed by Nev. Oh. You used to love church. <laughs> And we listened to Luke skip a talk, yeah. and things just made sense. 
He talked about combined families and families that are drawn apart by distance, but still families, and it, it just hit me. I couldn't have come on a better day than when I came when, when Luke was talking. He, he hooked me and I wanted to know more. Now since attending church, I've seen a change within myself. But I said it's been before that, but I disagree. But anyway, I'm wrong. <laughs> happy wife, happy life, as they say. But I've become a better father. I've become a better husband. I've become a better person. I used to get angry at the drop of a hat. You could literally drop a hat and I would go off my like that. Being a truck driver. Having to put up with caravans on the road. Sorry, Sorry. 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 We're the good guys. But when you get caravans sitting on 80 kilometers an hour in single lanes. I'm taking away. Cool. They go to 110. And then straight back to 80 when they come I'm not saying they do that, that's just what I've done. But I shouldn't get so angry, it's not good for me, it's not good for it's not good for anybody. And I've got this church, the people within, and God will thank for that. A few months ago, Don and I were sitting out the back, just talking, talking about God, why does things happen, the way that it does. And so, he knows exactly what we're going to do before we do it. He gave us our free choice to be able to do whatever we wanted to do. Our lives are like a choose your own adventure book. They start, they end, but they twist and turn all the way through. We're all going to the same place. But how we get there is up to us. We make the choices along the way. I know he was there beside me all the way. I didn't realise it until recently. He let me do the choices that I made. Because it's what I had to do for me. He didn't like the majority of the choices I made, but he was still there letting me go. We've continued to grow and learn through reading the Bible, talking to people, listening to the message every week. So from Nev to Norma, Joan to Jenna, Rob to Renee, and Carol to Carol, from the bottom of my heart, I thank each and every one of you for what you've done for me and my family. And at the start, I said, this is a special day for me. I mean, today marks one year since we walked through that door. And she took her feet off. Yeah, she took her feet off. One year. John, can you come up here as well, please? And Michael? And John. <laughs> See, the afternoon, John has been helping us with legs and what she does at the line. She comes every Sunday but she doesn't understand the meaning of why we are here. She was here for the food. Um, when she first had first communion, she doesn't know the meaning of it. She looks at the, the crack and went, where's the rest of it? <laughs> what is that? But she took it anyway. Now it's got to the point where I really don't want her to take the community because she doesn't understand what it's about. Joan, because of Sunday school, we don't have the Sunday school. The 
you the rest today. I was trying to ignore what was being said because I was still learning myself. And so I was e rigging while pretending to be dinner. <laughs> and it was part of the Bible, John the Baptist. And Jesus wanted to be baptized. John the Baptist said, You don't need to be. I still want to be baptized. You. Who did it? Now, I was christened when I was quite tiny. And I, I, I asked you, what is the difference between christened and baptized? Because mm -hmm. I thought it was one of the same thing. I thought, Catholic, you get baptized. Christian, you get christened. John explained to me that baptizing when you get submerged. Christened is was it the name? A name the ceremony? Yes. Yeah. Which I presume that yeah, I've been back to mm. it did get me thinking quite a bit. I thought about it previously and then it went to the slide. Said in talking to Jeremy the other night, just after Jeremy the match. I would, I would love to get baptized. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. New start, we've been here for a year. Mm -hmm. I feel it is now time to take the next step. Mm -hmm. I understand that a little bit more. I'm hoping Lex will mm -hmm. eventually, but I want that to be her choice. Mm -hmm. When she starts with some yes. to be Mm -hmm. What's that when we cross? That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But she's still part of time. Mm -hmm. So I would like. <laughs> we had made a decision that we would like all three. All three Joan, John, and Michael. To, be, to basically perform a ceremony for us and baptise us into a, a life of God. It's, it's a wonderful thing happening in your life. Well, I'm glad I didn't know half of what you were doing. <laughs> I didn't think I would be great at my death. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I got through saying what I did a little bit better than what you I did well. thought it was because I don't like that. We can organise that. That is it. That is fantastic. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone. You are my family. My family's of the UK. We don't talk. My kids don't talk because of who I've been with. So you guys are my family. Let's stand. Let's pray. Let's stand and pray for both. Do we might have morning tea? Anyone? We'll sing a song. Oh, there's a song. We're, we're singing a song. That's right. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for Diane Jamie's uh, declaration of faith in you today. Both have had a hard journey, but you've been there through the bad and through the good. And Lord God, I thank you that you brought them together. I thank you that you brought them to our church family, Lord, and we love them and care for them. And Lex and Father, we just pray the Holy Spirit upon them. Thank you for opening their eyes to your word the Christian faith, Lord God, and we uh, look forward to celebrating in their baptism soon, Lord, and we sort that. And uh, Father God, I thank you that as they publicly declare their faith in Jesus through baptism, Lord, we can all again serve them. And we thank you that you are indeed a good God and your timing is perfect. So we thank you, Lord, for today what Jamie shared, what we've sung, what we've heard. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to sing, blessed be.